pictures, but I just had to get it in there because I just say this all the time everywhere I go, and it's, I think it's the most common problem with nursing projects is that we fail to do that first and then we've contaminated our sample. So, PICO questions are wonderful for helping to develop your problem statement because it gives you your population. The I is what? Intervention. Intervention. The C is? The comparison group and O is the outcome. So, a PICO question looks sort of like this. This is the format for it. So as you're working on your project and your poster, if you're feeling like, gee, I don't really know how to, you know, tighten this up and I'm not sure how to, how to do my purpose, this is where you can start with your PICO question. So I gave just an example here. In elderly patients, does hourly rounding compared to bed alarms decrease the incidence of falls over a 30-day period? And so if I turn that then into a purpose statement, look how lovely that sounds. The purpose of this study was to determine if hourly rounding in patients over the age of 65 decreased the incidence of falls compared to bed alarms alone over a 30-day period. Now I know that's a big long purpose statement compared to what I was saying over here, but you'll trim that down. You know, you'll, but that's where you start with it. You gotta start somewhere and then you start trimming. That's what you do with posters. You have to edit, edit, edit to get it down succinct and taking out every unnecessary word. Posters don't have to have complete sentences. Just keep reminding yourself they're a summary, they're an outline, they're not complete sentences because then you end up with a bunch of words like the and and that you don't need. They don't serve any purpose. Then the next part, the, the third part, remember I started out saying First you want to have a really good title, then you need to have a purpose. Well now you want a background. This is the background of that clinical problem we were talking about. What is it? How have you defined it? State what the current literature says. I notice that a lot of project posters don't have that component and that's really unfortunate because any time that we are developing our interventions, we need to go to the literature. I mean, I may, I may decide that I think, well, why don't you guys give me one of your, give me an example of what project that you've decided to do so I can use one of your examples instead of mine. What is the, the essence of your study about noise? So we've had, up on Five West, we've had a lot of problems with um, patients complaining about noise at various times during the day, and so we're trying to come up with solutions to prevent noise and then, you know, improve patient outcomes and nurse satisfaction. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things going on there. We want to improve patient satisfaction. We want to decrease noise and in, improve, did you say nurse? Nurse, yeah. Nurse work environment. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of stuff, there's a lot of stuff going on there. So how are you going to measure that? Well, we just sent out a survey. Yeah. <laughs> We got really good feedback, and so we're going to um, hopefully decide on some interventions, and then we're going to resurvey all the nurses, and then not for this class, but for the unit, then we'll use the press gainy um, results for the patient. Good. Component. Press gainy is an excellent way to help define the problem with your baseline data. So, yes. You want to, before you jump into doing interventions now for noise, you have started to define the problem by doing these, um, these surveys. But you also want to see, you want to define the solution or the intervention, not just what you want or what, even what the nurses say they want. The nurses might say, well, we think that the problem is that, um, you know, um, there's too many alarms going off. The, the noise issue is really the alarms. It's not anything that the, other, that the thing that are, that's keeping the patients disturbed and bothered are the alarms. So you can find that out through a survey, but you could also get into the literature to find out 
What does the literature say is the most often thing that patients complain about? What does your press gainey say? And then what does the literature say are good interventions for reducing noise? There will be some things in there I promise that you haven't thought of if you don't get in there and let that inform what your intervention is going to be. And then once you've done that for your poster, you would just include maybe just three, four statements from the literature that show that you did your homework and that you're, you designed an intervention that's based on what the literature says. That's evidence-based practice. Otherwise, you're just guessing. You're assuming. You're just kind of, well, I, you know, the staff said they wanted to do this, so let's do this. If it's not based on evidence, you should not be doing it. End of story. Go to the literature and see what the literature says. And then include those in-text references. Now that's something that this student didn't do. She didn't include um, in-text references. And it's, it's, it's okay because she was presenting as a student in a student environment. But if you are presenting particularly, and I, I just want you to learn to do it right from the start. Start doing it right, right now. So that when you are presenting at state conferences, and I hope you will, that you are doing it in a way that you'll be very, you can be very proud of your poster and it'll be very professional. Okay. Um, so in our methods and st or study design, you're going to provide a description of the project. What was done? And how was it done? And who was the population? So a while ago I gave an example of um, decreasing, did, did, uh, did hourly patient rounding compared to bed alarms alone? decrease the incidence of falls in patients age 65 and older. Why do you think I picked age, patients age 65 and older? Because they're the highest risk for falls. Yeah, because they're the highest risk for falls. So then my study design is, it, it's really not hard. It's just going to be describing then that intervention of how did, how did we do the patient rounding? Um, how did I train, did I train the staff on it? Um, did, what did the hourly rounding include? Um, and any other factors that have to do with that intervention. Here's where you would describe it. Okay, the results and discussion of your findings. This is another thing that surprises me. I, I see so many posters that have so much stuff on them and then when it gets to this part, it's, it's, like, it's like an afterthought at the bottom right corner of the poster. Don't do that. That's what people want to see. I mean, it's, it's, you know, when I asked a while ago, what do you see when you first look at this poster? One of the things I heard was, I see research results. And that's what people want to see. When they walk to your poster, I promise you that after they look at the title and your purpose, they're going to quickly go right to here. They want to see what, it, what the purpose of your project was and what your outcomes were. You want to be sure that you provide at least a good third of your poster to talk about your outcomes and use bullet points to describe what those outcomes were. Again, you don't need complete sentences, but use bullet points because it really helps to show that you're going from one thought to another thought, organized by bullet points. And using these charts and graphs, it's wonderful. However, you do need, and she did here, you do need to have some sort of explanation because that, that makes sense to her, but it may not make sense to the person who's looking at her chart, at her graphic. And the other thing is that these are pretty small, aren't they? I mean, for the purpose of the poster, she might have been better off just pulling out maybe three of them and making them larger. Again, keeping in mind, the point of the poster is that you're trying to get your message out in about two minutes. So you have to consider, always considering content. Whenever you're working on your poster, you need to be constantly thinking, what can I get rid of? Not just what am I going to include, but what, doesn't what is not essential information? Because that's what posters are, essential information. 
And then the relevance to nursing. This is what it's all about. This is the so what of your poster. Why would someone want to listen to your, your spiel? Why would they care about your project or your research? Well, the bottom line is you've done something really great and you want to share that information so that they can take it back with them and perhaps even replicate your study with their own population at their own hospital or clinic or community center or whatever. So that is really where you know that you have contributed to nursing knowledge. When you have produced something that someone else will take with them back to their place of work and implement it in a way that enhances either nursing satisfaction on the job, nursing safety, or patient satisfaction and safety. You know, um, I have to pause for a little story here. I, I just, I, I love research, I just do. And I was with a friend a few years, about two, a couple of years ago, I guess. And we were at a, I'm dating myself here, but a Sarah McLaughlin concert. Do you, do you know Sarah? Do you, some of you know who Sarah McLaughlin is? I love her. And I love her not only because she sings like an angel, because she does. But every word that comes out of her mouth that she sings, she wrote it. And, wait, there's more. And she also arranged it. She plays the piano and she creates her own music and her own words for her music. She is such a creative energy. And so I... I said to my friend who was with me at this concert after it was over and I was just, you know, just loving Sarah and I, you know, at the end she, she quit singing way too soon because I wasn't ready for her to go but she didn't ask me. But she left and, you know, we, we all would pull that, used to be it was Bic lighters, but now, you know, pulled out our phones and we're waving it, Sarah, Sarah, come back, come back. And she did. And she sang a couple more songs. And then on the way home, I said to my friend, he said, you seem to have a really good time. And I said, I did, but you know, at the end, I was just thinking, it just came to me. Watching Sarah, listening to Sarah, being, experiencing her music, it's like nursing research. <laughs> and he said, the PhD program's getting to you, isn't it, Judy? I said, no, really, it is. I mean, isn't it? Isn't what Sarah does, she creates, arranges her own music, and then she performs it, and then we're standing out there singing it back to her. Right? We are. We're giving it back to her because it has resonated with us, and it's meant something to us. And so we're singing it because it matters. And that is like nursing research. That's what we want to have happen. And what you are doing when you are working on these projects, they're so important because that is the nursing language. What you do with your projects informs the profession of nursing. It's important. These posters are important. So I applaud your instructors for giving you such worthwhile projects to, to be involved in. The poster. Now I've finally gotten to the poster. So, We've already talked about limiting that amount of content. I think I've driven that point home. Not complete sentences, bullet points. Okay, here's something that's kind of important. Actually, it's very important. Follow the sponsor's instructions. Well, in this case, it's your instructor's instructor instructions, which happens to be assignment guidelines. So that's, you know, that's a no-brainer. But when you are really presenting it professionally, the sponsor, which is typically, you know, it's a, a professional organization like the American Nurses Association. Do any of you belong to professional organizations? Good. If you don't, you should. Again, it's the, we, we are a body of nursing professionals. So we extend and expand that body of knowledge through our 
our professions after you get out, out of your academic programs, that's what's going to keep you connected in your areas of specialty. So I strongly encourage you, choose professional organization that you can align yourself with. And that's where you will most likely then do things like this. And it'll keep you engaged. So follow what the sponsor says they are very, very specific about the guidelines. I, I brought this because sometimes, depending on how many posters, they might tell you this is the size. Most of the time, this is standard. This poster is four feet wide by three feet long. And that's pretty typical, pretty standard. Um, so, but if you show up, at your poster reception with something like this, when all they have is room for something like this, you're not going to be showing your poster. So you have to follow the sponsor's instructions and they will tell you, sometimes they get as specific as the type font and everything. So just be sure and follow that closely. Also I have here a question, was your abstract accepted? So typically the way that you apply to present a poster is you submit an abstract, just a one page abstract and usually a couple of objectives that say what the purpose is, uh, wh what you want the viewers to get out of, what they're going to get out of looking at your poster. So you usually do just a brief abstract and a couple of objectives. So you don't show them your poster right out of the gate. You don't, I mean they're thinking that you're not even going to make your poster until you've been accepted. So if your abstract was accepted, that's sort of your contract then with the sponsor. Because I've seen this happen too. I've seen nurses who have this wonderful project and all these outcomes and they start doing a poster that's on that project and, and other, other components of the outcomes and they forgot to go back and look at the, what they told the sponsor they were going to do. So if you submitted an abstract and it was accepted, that is like a contract. That's what you are supposed to produce when you show up. And content. This will help you learn what to weed out of a poster. All content should relate back to the po purpose of the poster. If it doesn't, get rid of it. Everything in that poster if it does not feed back to the purpose, then it does not need to be there. Okay, consider your audience because as we've talked, they're not captive. They're meandering around. And so you, you have to consider that um, you're kind of getting them on the run and you might even find that you're walking with them a little bit or that, um, or again, that you're stepping out and encouraging them to come over. Consider the audience. Is this a high level professional event or is this something that's a bit more casual, maybe it's a local, um, you know, sort of like what you're having here is it's, it's certainly considered not casual but it's not a high level, you're not expected to produce a research poster is what I mean by that. I'm not minimizing your projects. I think they're extremely important. But you understand there's different levels. And some that are highly professional would not accept posters that didn't have research components woven throughout. So you have to consider the kind of poster presentation you are applying for and be sure to read about it and make sure that it's consistent with the kind of poster that you want to present. And always consider your use of jargon. A really good example of this, I'm involved in a really neat research study and it is looking at the brand image of the nursing profession and it's, it's looking at how nurses perceive themselves, our brand, the way that, and, and when I mean brand I'm not talking about a logo or an ad. I'm talking about the brand image, what you, the, what you think of when you think of nurses. And so we've conducted a number of, of surveys 